500 times in scripture some form of the word joy or rejoice and then in fact when you look at the the characteristics or the qualities of the quintessential spirit-led Christian life second only in line to joy to love is joy itself together it's love and joy that seem to define what it means to be a Christian whose walk is firm with God Joy is not an afterthought of God's. It's, it's striking that it's not only a hallmark of Christian maturity, but it is what I believe to be one of God's central purposes in the human heart. Witness with me some of the final words of Jesus. Here he is together with his very closest and dearest friends on earth, his disciples. On the eve of his crucifixion, together there in the upper room, they are celebrating their last moments together before his death on the cross, just hours away from when he would be nailed to a tree to take on the sins of the world. He gave them that night words of hope, words of encouragement, words of warning, to be sure, words that humbled them, words that helped them understand that their dependence was in him alone, and only through him could they bear fruit. Words that helped to metamorphosize these 11 men to become more than conquerors. Those who would storm the gates of hell. Those who would bring his gospels to the world. The greatest missionaries and the first missionaries the world has ever known. And that night, in the middle of it all, he tells them why he's saying these words to them. He says in John chapter 15, verse 11, These things I have spoken to you, all that I've said so far, all that I'm bringing to you now, this entire discourse, I've said it for this reason, that your joy, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. In other words, I'm exhorting you and strengthening you in all these words that I'm giving you now, not merely so that you would become more obedient, that you would be more conformed to my image, that you would have a better witness in a, in a sin-hardened and skeptical world, or even just that you would reflect my glory in your character and in your ministry. All of that's true. But beyond that, on this, our final night together, and what should be one of the darkest moments in human history, I said all these words, that you might be filled with joy. It defies the imagination. You see, the scriptures say a lot about joy. And it is one of the purposes of God in the human heart to fill us with His joy. It's not just a purpose, it's a mandate. If you actually look at the words of Paul, he pulls no punches. Over and over again, as Todd's going to be bringing us through the book of Philippians over the next several weeks, He's already begun in this, in this uh, wonderful little four-chapter epistle. Paul says uh, again and again the same thing. He feels no pressure, like some preachers of today, to come up with the newest and the latest and the most innovative way of, of expressing some new idea. No. He says, I'm going to tell it to you again and again. Listen to it. Finally, brethren, my, rejoice in the Lord. Here he is in the beginning of chapter 3. He's only halfway through his book and he's already saying, finally. I love how he does that. Some preachers do that today too. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. And it is a safeguard for you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. It's a mandate. He's both, un- he's both unequivocal and intentional in his words. Joy must be ours. It must be continuous. Rejoice always. Not just when we feel like it. And it must be in the Lord. This is the command from God. I don't claim to be an expert on this topic of joy. And I confess to you that I find it lacking far too often in my life. But as I've studied the Word, it's become clear to me that God means for us to experience it, and not just in punctuated bursts, not just passively waiting on a feeling. Joy is not merely one of those holy obligations by which Christians should be marked and differentiated from all others. More than mere duty, it is a gift. 
a gift from our Father that does not wear with use or lose its appeal. Spurgeon, when he preached a sermon in 1895, captured it this way. He says, It will be our first business at this time to consider this grace of joy. Rejoice in the Lord, says the Apostle. What a gracious God we serve, who makes delight to be a duty, and who commands us to rejoice. Should we not at once be obedient to such a command as this? It is intended that we should be happy. You see, God has wired the human heart to long for joy. The minds behind the Westminster catechisms had it right with a rather unexpected opening statement. This is how they begin all of their entire doctrinal teaching. They say the chief end of man is what? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's beautiful. The second thing I found is I walked through the scriptures and tried to learn all I can about joy is that it's dishearteningly elusive for so many people, even Christians in His church. Whether we know it or not, we long for joy. We may even be persuaded that joy is meant for us, but it escapes us. We come to think of joy as as dependent on circumstances, or perhaps only for certain temperaments or personalities. It's just not my disposition. Too often we find ourselves bereft of joy and start to grow cold toward the things of God with hearts that slowly calcify. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you these questions now. Are you in danger of this right now, yourselves? Does this describe you? Because even though the joy may have felt like it's gone, the longing for it is not. Are you settling for cheap imitations, poor quality substitutes that not only can never replace joy, but instead actually have the effect of stealing it further and further away from you? You have an enemy of your soul who works hard. This is his job description. Sure, he was a liar from the beginning, but what does he actually do? What does Satan spend all of his energies doing? Here's what he does. He steals, he kills, and he destroys. That's what he knows how to do best. And if he can't rob you of your faith, he will try to rob you of your joy. You see, we are meant to be a people absolutely saturated with holy joy. And yet far too frequently we feel it inevitably and eternally escapes us. There are a few blessed souls out there, you probably some here in the audience, for whom a joyful disposition comes naturally. God bless you. We love you. But for most of us, as Pastor John Piper, a great writer of many Christian books, he worded it this way. He said, joy is something you fight for. You have to fight for it because you're in a battle. So today I hope to unpack a few scriptures for you. We're going to do a little bit of a whirlwind tour. I'm going to do the best I can to put some tools in your toolbox. In fact, really some weapons in your armory in the battle. Because there's an overwhelming testimony of God's Word, in God's Word, of abounding joy, both experienced and expressed. And I see it in four very specific aspects of the Christian life. When I found the word joy or any form of it throughout the Scriptures, it kept kind of appearing in one of these four places. This is the overwhelming testimony of Scripture. It's found in in four areas, and I did the best I could to kind of, for those of you who are note-takers or just want to have some sort of memorability to this whole thing, I tried to give you four words that begin with the letter S, a little bit of alliteration for you. We find joy in our salvation, our submission, our service, and in one other that I'll describe to you later. First of all, there is joy in our salvation. The rescuing of souls from the curse of sin and the wrath of God is no small significance in his eyes. First Peter describes the unfolding of God's redemptive plan on earth as something that angels are literally craning their necks to see. Peter says, these are things into which angels long to look. 
where they're not just wishing it from afar. They are actively and energetically trying to see what God is doing on the stage of planet Earth in His redemptive history. It's amazing that angels are looking and seeing at what's going on down here. All the world's a stage, Shakespeare says, and you are the participants. You are the actors on the stage. God, in His redemptive work, is unfolding His plan. And there, the angels, is the audience upon this whole stage looking down. And on the day that you finally turn your heart to Christ and become a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, heaven erupts with joy. It says in Luke chapter 15, I tell you, Jesus says, that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over just one who repents. Isn't that beautiful? There's joy in heaven. But the joy isn't really just meant to be theirs. It's for you too. Indeed, it's for you first. The scriptures seem to exhort us again and again and again to remind ourselves of this great salvation that we have. I want you to listen again to the words of Peter. We're going to take you back to 1 Peter chapter 1. I've been spending a lot of time here in 1 Peter. Thanks for the privilege for those of you who's, who are parents and have allowed me to teach your children in 1 Peter over here in this room. It's been an awesome experience. I love that book. I think that God's given us a hunger for, for the things in that book. And this is how Peter, after a few introductory remarks and greetings, this is how he starts. He says, this is the matter of first importance. Let's share it together. He begins with a song. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Where is that inheritance? It's reserved in heaven for you. You who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this salvation, you greatly rejoice. Even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. Obtaining is the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Isn't the joy in this passage just palpable? There is no more spiritual and appropriate response to the rescue of our souls from sin and its curse than joy. Inexpressible, complete, pervasive, utter joy. King David writes this way in Psalm 9. He says simply, I will rejoice in your salvation. And centuries later, in the epistle of Jude, we see the author write these words, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. 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 He's so good. Brothers and sisters, I want you to reckon with the impact of your salvation. If you are in Christ, this is how your salvation works. First, what God did for you when He saved you was He justified you. That's a technical term if you're not familiar with it. It simply means, in the language of the Scripture, that He declared you righteous. It was an instantaneous process. It did not depend one iota on you. This was by grace alone, through faith alone, not by works. No one's boasting in the court of God's law. What he did first was a legal rescue. He said, no more penalty, no more condemnation, no more accusation can stand. The one that I have, and not only innocent, 
Not merely forgiven of his or her sins. Not just a slate that's been wiped clean. No, no. <laughs> what go, it goes far beyond that. Now, what we have here is an individual who has now the righteousness of Jesus Christ counted to their account. That's glorious. First it was a legal rescue. And then and only then is it a moral rescue. On that day, on that moment, the day you first believed, the moment you first believed, that's when God began the process, the lifelong process, what we call sanctification, of drawing Him closer to you, to Himself and making you more conformed to His image. It's all of it, both of it, justification, sanctification. Your whole salvation is dependent on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. God began His gracious work through His Spirit, and He's still continuing it today. But it's important that you do not confuse these two. Because the people that do, that really is the beginning of despair, is it not? This is what can rob you of your joy. If you mix these two ideas up, and you somehow think that your salvation is dependent upon something that you have to do, or that God is perpetually displeased with you, even though you've already believed, and put your hope and your trust in His cross... And folks, this is going to rob you of your joy. You, you stand firm on the promise that God has made, that not only are you forgiven of your sins, but you are declared righteous forever. This is good. This is what John Bunyan and so many others, I could tell you stories of Martin Luther, St. Augustine, so many great patriarchs of old, and today to some extent, even my own story. But let me tell you about John Bunyan. This is the Tinker of Bedford from the 17th century England, a humble man who was radically transformed, spent 12 years, actually more than 12 years, in prison. He was the one who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, and if it says anything about him, he was a contemporary John Owen, an incredible intellect, a man of God, who was asked once... Why do you uh, like this fellow Bunyan so much? They knew each other. They bumped into each other. They ran some of the same circles. Do you have respect for this man? John Owen was asked. Owen's answer was, I would gladly trade all my learning and intellect for the tinker's ability to touch men's heart. This is why today, perhaps, the Pilgrim's Progress is after the Bible the most widely translated and published book in the history of the world. He says something there. And he tells a little bit of his own autobiographical story there. Because when Bunyan was not a believer, but he felt the heaviness and the oppressiveness of God, he was racked with guilt. He was crushing like a load of, of rocks or bricks that he could not bear. This was a man who was under perpetual sorrow. Until one day he walked out into the field and all of a sudden these words came to his heart. Your righteousness is in heaven. Your righteousness is in heaven. And suddenly like a ton of bricks, <laughs> not the ones he was bearing on his back but falling from the sky, it hit him. And the man was gloriously transformed. It is not my doing. I can't possibly live up to the law of God and I, have, I really have to stop trying. That is not how I become saved. Your righteousness is in heaven. It is at the person and the work of Jesus Christ. That's love incarnate. When he finally realized this, the burden was lifted. And the man went on to write some of the greatest classics in the Christian world of Christianity we've ever known. Get this much right. Reflect on what God has done. Stand firm in the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. And as Peter says, greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Both in the here and now, and in eternity, there is joy in our salvation. There's joy too in our submission. I thought long and hard about this. I wish there was a better word beginning with the letter S that really captures all that I mean by this. I, what do I put here exactly? Is it sanctification? Certainly, submission to the will of God, to our Father. Once you have been justified, declared righteous in God's court, 
There's now the business of about hungering and thirsting for righteousness, as we heard from one of the Chu children just a few minutes ago. He wants us to become like Him. This is, this is what it means to live a life of joy. Certainly, it's a starting point to submit to His will. But, and a, a Christian who refuses to let go of some habitual sin or some unbecoming attitude robs himself or herself of much joy and invites much misery. But there's more at play here. By submission, I, I want to convey also this idea of a continual drawing near, a growing intimacy, a deepening love for God Himself. Jesus spoke of these two ideas, submission to His commands, abiding in His love, as inextricably linked. They were inseparable. And together, the outcome of it all is joy. I want you to turn with me back to the passage we read earlier in John chapter 15. Let's go there together. John 15, verses 10 and 11. It's an important verse. John 15, 10 and 11. Jesus combines these two ideas of submission to God, of of submission to His will, abiding by His commands, and abiding in His love. He says there, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Do you see the relationship here between love and joy? How they cannot be separated? How a heart for God, a heart to do what He calls us to do, and a deepening love for Him, an intimacy with the God of heaven, are inseparable. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Psalm 1611. I actually debated long and hard about actually uh, letting this be my text for the day. In the end, I decided there's so much more to say, but I almost took you through Psalm 16. Earlier this year in January, I walked through a sermon in Psalm 32, another of David's psalms. This particular psalm, I encourage you to take on your own this week and spend some time there. It has ministered to me very deeply. Not just this, the culminating verse, the climax of the entire thing, but the entire psalm. Absolutely beautiful and saturated with joy. You prick it and it bleeds joy. It's an amazing psalm. Please go there and spend some time there. But here is how King David of Jerusalem climaxes his entire worth. He says in Psalm 1611, You have made known to me the path of life. Now by life, he's not just talking about a beating heart or breath. He's not just talking about a living creature. He's not even just talking about the promise that we have of eternal life. Certainly those those ideas are encompassed. And what he says here, you have made known to me the path of life. But I believe David is going much beyond that. In the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's saying to us that the life that I'm talking about is a spiritual vitality and an aliveness, if you will. A oneness and an intimacy with God. He says in Psalm 1611, You have made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand there are pleasures evermore. If you feel like you've ever known only a half-baked joy, the shadow and not the substance, a hollow shell of what it should be, then I contend you've been looking in the wrong place. The fullness of joy, joy that leaves you literally inexpressible and full of glory, this comes with a nearness and a sweet fellowship with the living God. David's path of life is what the New Testament offers, what Paul especially calls walking in the Spirit. This is the language he uses in Galatians chapter 5. He says, walk in the Spirit. We've already mentioned that the fruit of the Spirit, right after love, comes joy. These two are paired together very often in Scripture. Joy falls only second in line to love, but this is the evidence of a life in the Spirit. But sandwiched on either side of that little verse, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. That verse falls squarely between two commands. And those commands say, walk by the Spirit. That's the context here. 
the path of life, David says. Learning to walk in the Spirit, loving God more than the world's temptations, invokes a joy that's greater than anything you've known. Listen to this, just some, some samples from the New Testament. Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were continually filled with the joy and the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of who? The Holy Spirit. You starting to see a connection here? I want you to contrast this with what God's Word says in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now this is a word, this is a command, this is a warning. For those under the Old Covenant, listen to how the words are framed here. Through Moses, God says these words, Deuteronomy 28, 47. He says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and with a glad heart for for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in the lack of all things. And he will put an iron yoke around your neck until he has destroyed you. Did you catch that? In other words, joy in submission to God was for the people of ancient Israel under the Old Covenant a condition. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and with a glad heart, he goes on to tell them the outcome will be destruction. It was a condition. The faithfulness and obedience to God for them depended upon the attitude in which they obeyed. If they did not submit to Him specifically with joy and with a glad heart, then the consequences were even as if they had not submitted to Him at all. In Christ, everything changes. This is how things are structured in the New Testament. Under the the economy of the New Covenant, In Christ, joy is not a prerequisite. It's an outcome. This is what you get as a result of being saved. This is what you get as a result of drawing near to your God, submitting to Him joyfully, submitting to Him willfully. Joy comes in abundance. The Psalms, too, say this everywhere. For those who find delight in submission to God simply for the sake of submitting to God, it's not a fear-induced prerequisite, but a spontaneous, irresistible outcome. It's explosive. As it is in Philippians, here it is in the Psalms, our joy is in the Lord. Psalm 511, let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy all you who are upright in heart. And so it continues for dozens upon dozens of examples. This might be the single most prevalent reason for joylessness in the modern materialistic church. We fail to delight in the true giver of joy and settle instead for almost anything else. The Lord Jesus made it clear that joy was so profoundly needed and we're so longing for it but it's accessible to all who call upon His name and draw near to Him. There is joy in our submission. There's joy also in our service. This is a strange economy of what we call short-term missions. Anyone here ever been involved in short-term missions before? I have. This is how I met my wife. Perry and I first met on the mission field, or in a manner of speaking, the short-term mission field. We were both employees or or ministers, if you will, missionaries with the short-term missions agency. We hosted many, many groups, dozens and dozens of groups every summer that came to places like uh, the border of Mexico, to Guatemala, to inner city Philadelphia, to Peru, places that were forsaken a lot lot of times, uh, drug-infested, crime-infested, poverty-ridden places that we really desperately needed the gospel. I've personally met people in inner city Philadelphia that had never heard of the name Jesus Christ. We went to these dark places and brought groups of people coming from churches, adults, youth. They came for a week. 
two weeks, sometimes a summer, and they just worked. They just served. They came and they they decided to love people and share the gospel and hold, host vacation Bible schools and all of this. And Perry and I were the ones that were staying behind after these groups left and went and found those people that gloriously and marvelously came to Christ in the midst of these ministries. And we helped find local churches, good, strong local churches that we partnered with to plug them in and help them grow in their faith. What was strange about this is the people that came on the trips, the ones who came to serve, were ready to just be world changers. And they watched for the first time in their lives, for many of them, the incredible work of God, the handiwork of God in the lives of lost sinners. They were watching people come to Christ, seeing that through their own testimony, their own words, someone bowed their head in faith, repented of their sins, and drew near to the living God for the first time. It was amazing. But what was strange is that the joy, I think, might have even been stronger in those who came. It was amazing to watch because these people came really not knowing what to expect, really far out of their comfort zones, and left at the end of the week saying, Behold the wonders of God. He did this through me. My life has changed forever. This is a lot what happened when Jesus sent out 70. He called to himself 70 disciples in Luke chapter 10 and sent them out on something like a short-term missions trip. He sent them out in his name and in his power and told them that they would encounter rejection and by some there would be hardships on the journey itself. But when they finally came back, And they reported to Jesus. Here is what they said in Luke chapter 10, verse 17. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus said, you ain't seen nothing yet. It gets better than this. They came back with joy because they purposed in their hearts to serve. That was then. 2,000 years ago. It was Jesus himself that sent them out. I guess in a way he's still sending us out, isn't he? But can it really be that simple? In my fight for joy, because I know it's a fight, I have to fight for it, could it really be that even when I feel downcast, even when I feel like the clutches of darkness are completely encompassing me, when I feel guilt when I feel distance, when I feel darkness, can simply rolling up my spiritual sleeves and getting my spiritual hands dirty for the kingdom of God actually flood my heart with joy? Can it have that kind of an impact on me? I want you to listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 58. If you'd like to turn there, you can, but I'll read them aloud to you. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 10 and 11. Listen to the words of the prophet. He says, If you pour out yourself for the hungry, and you satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday sun. And the Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your desire in scorched places, and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Isn't that amazing? He says, if you pour yourself out on behalf of other people, if you purpose yourself to love and to serve the afflicted and the needy, you will become not just like a watered garden, surely, You'll be drinking deeply from the life-giving sustenance that His grace has to offer you. If you have felt parched, if you have felt like scorched earth, if you have felt dry and far away from God, maybe it begins with just pouring yourself out to other people. Maybe, maybe. This opens up a new world of opportunity and all of a sudden those gardens of yours become well watered. But you see, it goes beyond that. Isaiah's promise, the Lord's promise to us through Isaiah, says not only will you be like a well-watered garden, you will be a spring of water whose waters never fail. You see, you'll now be watering other people's gardens. You will be a conduit, a channel through which His life-giving water flows. 
everything changes. So saints, spend yourselves. Spend yourselves and be spent. Find your ministry. Open up the Word of God and and work and, and encourage and strengthen those whose hearts are hurting. Look around you. Even here in this building, there are needs to be met. There's ministry to be done. There's service to do. Because there's joy to be found. Now time fails me to speak in any depth of the final area of our Christian experience that the scriptures overwhelmingly testify. That could be a source of joy. This is the area of the Christian life that's most surprising. In fact, I would even say astonishing. This is the place where you would least expect to find joy. It doesn't make sense. It defies logic. I could actually spend a whole other sermon, a whole series of sermons, Todd probably wouldn't let me do that, but if I ever had that opportunity, maybe one day we could unpack this about the relationship between joy and suffering. I want you to consider earlier our text from 1 Peter. This was just a glimpse into this amazing epistle that we've had the chance over the last few months to work together with with the youth. This little epistle, five chapters, unquestionably serves as the treatise, the Christian treatise of suffering. It has the most comprehensive treatment of it. It gives hope beyond anything else we've ever seen. Surely, the scriptures talk about suffering all throughout. But if you want to go to the one place where you are suffering right now, or know someone that is, you want to go to the one place that will give you a wellspring of hope in life, you go to the book of 1 Peter. It's everywhere. Because in the midst of such suffering, the people to whom Peter was writing were going through intense persecution and suffering, and it was about to get worse. And today he still writes to us. But if you look carefully at his words, you will find the book of 1 Peter absolutely sizzling and crackling with joy. It's in every chapter. It pervades the entirety of this epistle. To the unregenerate and immature mind, this makes no sense whatsoever. But to those who spend their years drawing near to the living God, who have tasted and seen that He is good, and even tasted suffering and known how to respond well, they can suddenly see that suffering can be the kindness of God manifest, drawing them closer still. I mentioned earlier John Piper, who wrote the words that you have to fight for joy in the very year that he discovered he had cancer. Now, that's the time that a long-serving pastor might be tempted to say, you know what, I'm done. I, my ministry's over, I've, done, I've fought the good fight, I've run the race. You know, right now I'm just feeling a little sorry for myself. I could just curl up in a fetal position and hide in a closet somewhere. The reaction could be shaking your fist at God, defying Him and saying, you know, why have you abandoned me? Have you left me behind, oh God? This wasn't Piper's response. When he learned he had cancer, he found that he had a new, a vibrancy and a life and a vitality to his faith that he had never yet known. All the last shreds of self-dependence eroded away. And he said, this, this cancer of mine has drawn me closer to God than I've ever been before. It's been a particularly sweet time of fellowship with my God and my Savior. He actually called it his friend. I'm not one that's speaking out of any sort of knowledge here. I'm only relying upon the testimony of greater men, men who have gone before who have suffered so greatly. I haven't suffered that way. But I am confident that God in His providence knows what He's doing, and if right now you are suffering or you know someone that is, joy need not escape you. And in fact, suffering can even be the tool that God uses to increase your joy. I want you to think about this. James, his opening words of his epistle, the matter of first priority in the epistle of James. Only one epistle from this man. We only hear from him once in the New Testament. He says, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to change the way you think about suffering. (laughs) 
James chapter 1, verse 2. He says, Consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials. Peter, same idea, same exact Greek words, actually. We actually read the verse a little bit earlier. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 6, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Peter's treatise on suffering is not just about the persecution kind. It's about a whole wide array of suffering in all of its forms. Together, these two really agree. Peter states it as plain fact. James gives us the injunction, reminds us, exhorts us. But they both agree, whatever suffering God in His grace allows you to pass through, even right now at this moment, the undercurrent through it all is not a weakness or a buckling of the knees, not a hopeless despair, nor a grumbling, hard-hearted callousness toward God. The very heartbeat of suffering in the Christian life can be, should be, and is joy. Because your Savior first knew it. For the joy set before Him, Jesus went to the cross. Isn't that amazing? So as He did, so must we. Be assured, dear brothers and sisters, that in spite of what the world tells you, there is joy even in suffering. So, what do we learn? We know true Christian joy when we are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, and that we remind ourselves of how great that salvation really is. If you've forgotten, if you've grown a little comfortable with the idea, and have forgotten the explosive joy that this salvation, this justification that God has given to you, go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and spend a little time there. Just drink it in. Christian joy comes when you reflect on the great salvation that God has given you. We also know joy when we submit to the will of the Lord Jesus and in fact draw near to Him in intimacy. Stop running from Him. We know joy when we serve in the name of the Lord Jesus like a wellspring of water and a well-watered garden. And finally, when we suffer for the sake of the Lord Jesus. I want you to know that each one of these four aspects of the Christian life really share several things in common. They share these characteristics. First of all, each and every one of them are possible only in Christ alone. Not just the salvation bit, all of it. Only in Christ is any of this possible. Life apart from Jesus Christ is the very definition of despair. A life in Him where you are growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Where you know and love Him more in 2016 than you did in 2015. And you love Him still more and know Him still better in 2017 than you did this year. That is joy. There's something else these share in common. They're meant to be expressed. Sometimes it's true. Paul says that there is such a thing as an unspeakable joy. This is his words. A joy that leaves you literally unable to speak because you're so filled with His goodness. And Peter even says, joy that's inexpressible and full of glory. So wait a minute, this sounds like something of a contradiction, but if you look throughout the entire testimony of Scripture, if you look at the number of times the word joy or any of its forms are used in Scripture, people, there's a lot of shouting and singing going on. It's meant to be expressed. Joy is not something you bottle up inside. Share it. It will become more real to you as you do. Psalm 107, verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. (laughs) Let them say so. Because He has redeemed them from the clutches of the adversary. He has rescued you from the power of darkness, from the dominion of hell. Just like we sang earlier today, He has rescued us from all of that. Go and tell the world. I promise you, joy will follow. And the last thing is that joy involves risk-taking. Great risk-taking. You see, joy is risky. It's not the kind of risk-taking that can be labeled as plain stupidity or tomfoolery. These are calculated risks. After fully weighing the cost, they are big risks. Tremendous risks. But they're not stupid. You see our salvation from our God. 
our submission to our God, our service of our God, and our suffering for our God and His great name. Those are all risky propositions indeed. Most people in this world spend their lifetimes trying to avoid these four things. Conscientiously or not. But the funny thing about the risk of joy is that unlike any financial investment I've ever heard of, it's an all-or-nothing proposition. Think it through. Certainly, any bond or, or stock or mutual fund that you invest, anything worth its salt is going to give some sort of uh, maybe linear returns, maybe geometric concern, uh, returns. Whether I sink $100 or $100,000 into that investment, I can reasonably hope for some good rate of return, hopefully proportionate to the risk of the investment I put it in. But see, here's the economy of the kingdom of God and how joy works. The risk and returns of joy in the Christian life is different in this way. It demands 100% investment. 100% of all you are and all you hope to be. Wholehearted devotion to the pearl of great price. Forsaking all, I gain everything. Missionary martyr Jim Elliott put it this way. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And there was a man who put his money where his mouth was. If you want joy, people, you must take risks. Huge risks, but wise risks. So, I want you to be willing to take risks. If you have been keeping the Almighty God at arm's length and resist His grace because your sensibilities and your honor are offended by the concept that you are a sinner, that you sin and have violated His holy law, stop resisting. Joy, true, profound joy, can only be yours in His salvation. It will perpetually evade you otherwise. All the highest good and altruism and free thinking you ever want to conjure will leave you completely empty-handed, bankrupt at the end of your life. If you want joy, real joy, you must be saved. Take the risk. Yes, it requires faith. But so does your worldview. If you have not reckoned now with the plight of your sin and with the cross of Jesus Christ, the time is right now. A whole lot more than your joy is at stake. Secondly, if you as a Christian have been long clinging to that pet sin of yours, your sharp tongue, your wayward thought life, your materialistic and petty cravings, your dark closets of hidden sin, and take a risk and let them go once and for all. Let them not be your master anymore. In sweet submission, learn to love the Son of God more dearly than you love your sin. Let it die a death of cold irrelevance. For there is no joy in darkness and misplaced love. You will not find it there, I promise. It leads only to ruin. Take the risk of obeying God, the God that you love, and know the fullness of joy. In His presence, there is fullness of joy. Thirdly, if you, dear believer, are convinced that toil and labor and love and the unlovable people of the world belong to people that are better qualified or with more free time or with greater patience and energy than you have, then stop kidding yourselves and dive wholeheartedly into a life of service for other people. True joy will forever escape you if you do. You'll soon find that a life... Once you live a life of service to others without forsaking devotion to Christ Himself now, the more joy will be yours in abundance, I promise. And if you, beloved, finally are anxious about undeserved suffering and see it as an enemy rather than a friend and do all you can to circumnavigate it when you see it coming, then stop cowering in fear and in dismay. I'm not saying you should invite suffering. Don't. That's not what I'm saying. But when it comes in the providence of God, take the risk and embrace all of it in His strength. Don't become a hardened, cold cynic or a simpering whiner in the face of suffering. You will begin to know the Lord Jesus, the forerunner in all suffering. And you will come to know His joys in ways you never knew possible. 
If joy has eluded you thus far, all I ask is that you stop running from those things that cultivate it. Stop settling for cheap shams and pale imitations. The genuine article is yours right under the Christmas tree. Yours for the taking. I want to close with this final word from Nehemiah chapter 8. It says very simply, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Today and every day that follows, may God fill us up with the strength that is His joy. Amen? Let's pray.